activists here, keep your eyes, ears open to what's happening everywhere, and I know a lot of you do. Um, I've always known about this space since it opened, and I really like what happens here, and if people can support it in any way and spread what it is that we all about, what we're all about, I think that's great, okay? Um, keep on doing the work that you do if you do it. Right now. Okay. The idea for Who's Emma came, it sort of developed really slowly out of other things that were happening at the time. There was a thing in Toronto called the Toronto Hardcore Hotline. And basically you could phone up and they had a tape recorded message that would tell you where all the shows were that week. And you could leave a message if you were a band or whatever and say that you were having a show. The scene was like really restricted in how it could grow because there wasn't the space for bands to, to play. So there were these kind of various different needs. In 95, we had a meeting. So we had a couple of meetings um, and they were like really bad. You know, um, guys interrupting women speaking, people getting all upset and everybody was just really bummed out and upset. And the next year I had a year off from work, which was a super important year for me because I'd been in school every year since I was four. So I'd never had a year off. So I really desperately wanted a year off. I didn't really want to do academic stuff with it. I wanted to do something practical, hands-on, different. For me, it was always an anarchist project. Um, not in the sense of, you know, some 19th century guy in a cape tossing a black bomb with a fuse, but anarchist in the sense of self-organized, believing in consensus, believing in collectivity, and questioning big corporations, all of those kind of things. A group of us who had been sort of doing some reading together and thinking about different collective spaces and how to, different collectives had operated and how to start a new one. And I think it was partly out of those discussions that Who's Emma came. I think naming your, your info shop or store after, with a question is, is a good idea because people would actually come in and ask. The million dollar question. Um, for me, it always referred to Emma Goldman, um, the, the famous anarchist who died a couple of blocks from here. I, I knew that Emma Goldman lived near Kensington Market um, when she got kicked out of the United States for being an anarchist. She was regarded as this crazy, wild woman because she went around talking about things like um, birth control, which wasn't something that you talked about back then. She was kind of an icon for feminism as well, and and a really terrific speaker and sort of rabble rouser and intellectual, as well as having a whole kind of action-oriented politic as well that, that kind of has continued to inspire anarchists and, and such. There's a lot of really important things about Kensington Market. Uh, traditionally, it's uh, been an immigrant reception area, so there's like a lot of um, new startups, stores that can take place there. Both spaces that we were in were houses that were converted into like retail, right? Retail, so to speak. Whose Emma was kind of rough around the edges. It was like a hand-painted sign, and I think that, that there fe it felt like there was a kind of intuitive match between just the kind of Kensington randomness and Who's Emma randomness. There was Moonbeam Cafe where we used to get the coffee from, the, the fair trade coffee, and that was, you know, it was just in the market as well. I think to some degree the market was a natural home for Who's Emma. Rents were not nearly as high as they would have been for storefronts in some other areas of the city. And a lot of us were also attracted to the fact that the market had a sort of an interesting history of having been the site of radicalism and the site of various immigrant communities. 
I mean, the market's always been like a punk hangout, like since the late, late 70s. I mean, a bunch of fucking goofs, especially, and all that whole group of people very much associated with the, the market. And I was kind of very aware of the history of the market. And I always liked the market. It's always the kind of funkiest part of, of Toronto. Actually, I think my, my most vi vivid Who's Emma memory is the very, very first um, meeting um, when we weren't even really sure how we were going to operate and who the collective was going to be because um, it was shortly after it opened and there was a huge number of people and a huge circle like all, all around here. I'd say about at least 50, if not maybe even close to 100 people. Um, and we ran that meeting by consensus. Um, I think I facilitated it with one other person and, uh, and we decided to keep going um, via consensus. I mean, a lot of the ideas behind Who's Emma and the sort of anarchist sort of philosophy behind it is that, like, you know, democracy is um, it's not that great when you consider that, like, it means that 49% of any group could be totally unhappy. <laughs> and that's, like, that's not a very, it's not aiming very high, in my opinion. Collective meetings were once a month and took place in the basement of both stores you know, when we were on the north and south side. I do remember sitting on upturned milk crates <laughs> in a circle in the basement. And uh, yeah, it wasn't necessarily comfortable, but everybody was there for a reason. We would have a list of our agenda or whatever and go through the items and each item we'd have to basically come to consensus about what the decision was going to be. And so everyone had to agree. And if somebody didn't agree, they could either block it because they felt that strongly about it or they could just let it slide. I mean, the cool thing about Who's Emma was that I think a lot of people associated Alan with it, but when I was around, I mean, the majority of the people who worked there had probably even never met Adam or Alan because he sort of, he was like, this is, this is a store like me and other people started and then he, he really stepped back. And so there was a lot of it was like there was this Alan character that you would hear about, but he he really didn't have a lot to do with this the store in a day to day sense, which I thought was kind of cool. And yeah, I mean, there would nobody felt like there was a boss or anything. I mean, people had jobs, but it was I mean, whoever was working, people were just doing it all together. That I'm not the boss. I'm not in charge. That the decision making body is everybody who's involved. That we meet once a meet a month on the last Sunday of the month. And then that's where decisions get taken. The necessity to build a culture of consensus and a culture of collaboration and collectivity, that's key. We can say, okay, these are the rules of we're going to operate under. Um, people who facilitate meetings are going to do workshops and facilitation. We're going to actually spend time engaging what this process is and how, how it works for us and how it impacts both our projects and our way of dealing with the world. Go for it. Well, I was interested in anarchist politics, especially interested in books and zines, and also involved in hardcore. So, the whole, basically the entirety of it, really. There's no kind of monolithic entity that's the hardcore scene, punk scene, anarchism. There's so many different views people have. You know, people involved in hardcore aren't necessarily interested in anarchist politics. Um, there's no uniform way that people address the world or have uniform interests. So. There was a lot of people who were specifically interested in records and music and shows. Other people who were interested in it as a political and utopian project, in a sense. It was an established punk center. And it was, you know, as close as Toronto had to, you know, something like the epicenter or Gilman Street. And 
so being into punk rock and knowing about places like that in the States, whose MO was sort of what we had, what Toronto had? I guess the 90s scene grew, like the early 90s scene, the early, late 80s scene had grown out of um, a scene that was very politicized, but um, didn't deliver enough. And so the 90s scene was a reaction to try and make it even more of a threat. And that's like the era when profane existence first started and stuff like that. So profane existence was really a model for a lot of things that uh, Who's Emma were about. Um, profane existence is like a, a, a collective, an anarchist collective in uh, Minneapolis that um, uh, started a, a space and it started a label and started a zine. Fire hazard! Shows were awesome there. So many people would come and pack the basement and there would be like standing room only on the stairs at the back and then everybody would be hanging out upstairs in the shop. Before Who's Emma, people would find weird venues to do shows. And then after Who's Emma, it was sort of the same thing. But while it, while it was happening, like if there was a hard, like a DIY hardcore band coming in Toronto, they would play Who's Emma, just cause like, there was really nowhere else to play. If you think of most sort of touring hardcore bands, like, you know, aside from the 50 people in every city who knows who they are, like, what are you gonna do? Like, book a 500 person venue? No. This is a very tiny Come room. On. A summertime show in the basement of Who's Emma was. Oh, God. <laughs> it was like the long march to the sea. Just unbelievably hot and humid. Um, if you had 30 or 35 people down there, and I mean, that would be packed, like, yeah, you'd be dying. Who's Emma dealt with a lot of uh, touring bands, which normally wouldn't play Toronto because of a lack of all these place. I mean, all these peep bands don't deal with bars, so it can give it opportunity for more bands to, to come here. I really liked the shows there. It was like really easy, it was low stress, and it was just like this, the total like insular community vibe that you want to go along with that whole thing. It was a really large debate within punk and hardcore at the time in the mid-90s. You know, if you look back at issues of maximum rock and roll and look at the letters columns or the columns from that time period, you're going to see a huge debate raging. So you would work with people who had put out uh, smaller records and, you know, trade. So it was mostly barter, right? You would take some records and trade for some other records and then you'd just sell them for what, you know, to make back your money and whatever, or try to anyway. We were involved in the kind of, the network of the underground economy of punk and hardcore, of people releasing records in their garage or basement and sending them all over the world and trading them with other people. I'm seeing the zines. I ran a distro out of my bedroom, and that was my in at Who's Emma, was I supplied them with a lot of zines. Uh, I'm from a suburb in, in Toronto, so I'm from Scarborough originally. Nothing to do out in Scarborough. <laughs> I, was, I, I was too scared to go in for a while. It's funny, we've had conversations where, you know, there's this real intimidation factor when you're a teenager. It was kind of intimidating to go into Who's Emma because it was all these cute punk boys and they all knew, like, the names of 8,000 punk bands and I didn't and and then someone told me that the Monday shift was open and they actually needed to find a woman to fill, fill it so I was like I'll, I'll do it I really wanted I really want to volunteer well I was working my shift and I knew there there were a group of women who wanted to have I guess it was a, a feminist group or a women's group where they were gonna meet once weekly and I knew they were having their meeting that day, but I just felt like, you know, Who's Emma is an open space. They can sit and have their meetings. Some young kid, male, who I'd never seen before, tried to come into the store. And they basically rushed over to the door and said, I'm sorry, this is a woman's only space right now. And I was kind of baffled by what was going on because I thought they were just having a meeting, like, you know, let's meet and talk. I didn't realize they wanted to um, make the space a woman's only space. 
I was kind of like, you know, didn't want to be really confrontational. Mm -hmm. So I was always like super polite. Like, you know, if a guy came in and I'd be like, check it out, it's women's hour, sorry. We had people who, who really sort of took offense at it, I think from a really sort of problematic point of view, right? Who thought that, um, that we should basically just treat the entire scene as, you know, everyone says they're equal, so, so they are. Um, it's a really sort of underdeveloped analysis of how, how gender differences play each other out. There's other people who said, well, you know, it's not just about gender, you know, we need to have a queer safe space. Um, you know, what about the fact that the scene is mostly white? I mean, there's people who raised all kinds of other um, issues around representation and, and who felt represented and who felt safe. Then it was kind of weird because it was like, okay, men aren't allowed in the shop on this day. So it was like, okay. Um, fair enough, but then how does somebody know if they're just like new to the city or they're just like random and they just walk in and it's like, you're not allowed in here, it's kind of weird, right? So. It was kind of one element in my kind of, I guess, political awakening that I had associated with Who's Emma because, you know, gender politics in the hardcore scene I was coming from in Mississauga weren't very sort of hotly debated. Um, and there was just kind of a sort of entrenched sort of gender regime, I guess. and. Uh, at Huzema, there was I met a lot of men and women who were really interested in kind of shaking that up. I would stand behind it. I mean, I don't think I was... I think I went to it. I actually thought I was going to get laid a lot on Monday nights at the Women's Night. But, and I think some of us thought, I think that was the true motivation, was to cruise other chicks. Um, and I think there was quite a bit of that, actually. <laughs> so, woo! Um, so we had things like we had a bike repair workshop, we had a silk screening workshop, we ran a couple of workshops um, on aspects of actually running Who's Emma. So we had a facilitation consensus decision making workshop and then we had a bunch of things that came out of uh, the Women's Day. So then we, we had some discussions and workshops for women only, which were, which were pretty good. I remember doing sex, uh, sex ed workshops, like bringing sex toys and um um, did we have a fist self fisting workshop? I think we did. That was the 90s. Everyone was like <laughs> into burgeoning sort of identity politics and wanting to put what they're learning and thinking about into action. And you know, that's, that's a time that's rife of error. You make mistakes, you hurt feelings, you do things the wrong way, but you try. Well, definitely Who's Emma was, being the space that it was and occupying the position it did within the Toronto radical community for, for youth, not for everyone, but especially for kind of counterculture, young anarchist folks in Toronto, Who's Emma was a main site where things like meetings for organizing active resistance would happen. I went to some of the first meetings about active resistance. There was a big debate about whether it should be called an anarchist gathering and some people wanted it to be more, I don't know, what, liberal or something? There was a four or five day series of like a workshop that you were in with the same group of people for four or five days and you could pick the topic, so I just picked the topic, building revolutionary movements. And I was in this incredible group of people, and we talked about so many things, like um, how to mobilize people, uh, the idea of leadership, should we have leaders or not, and what does leadership mean, or how do we facilitate people's involvement without leadership, and how do we develop skills and knowledge, and um, that kind of thing without building hierarchies. Um, there's something about avoiding burnout, there's something about conflict resolution. A lot of us who've been involved in Who's Emma and active resistance at that point were basically done with organizing as, as anarchists and organizing out of that sort of youth counterculture. I think for Who's Emma and for the anarchist community in Toronto, it was really pivotal. And I think after that time, a lot of some of the anarchist influence, specifically at Who's Emma, started to 
perhaps decline. People were moving into other projects. And shortly after active resistance, the Anarchist Free School was founded. Um, a lot of people became more involved with OCAT. So I think things changed, but it was having an event that large in the city was it was an interesting time. Having had sort of pretty serious uh, critiques of the sort of youth, white, counterculture scene that was not really nearly as political as it, as it made itself out to be. Um, so I think there was a huge influx of people into, into OCAP after the summer of 1998, directly, <laughs> as a sort of a backlash. dog at this show and that's fucked up. I mean, can't you make the fucking connection to what this band is saying? The fucking animal exploitation, animal abuse. I bring your fucking dog to a show where his fucking eardrums are fucking shattering and shit. What the fuck is wrong with you, asshole? It's it's fucked up. Bring your Dude, the dog's like a baby, man. You guys yeah. can't be bringing it to this shit. Uh, what do you, why are you a punk? For what reason? For what reason what? what why are you wearing a leather? I like the way a lot of looks too, but the, the, the reality behind it is it's dead, and a lot of suffering went into it. And listen, I used to wear leather too. I'm not fucking, I'm not acting like I'm better than you because I'm not. We are equal. But listen, as long as you can, you, you continue to wear leather and you fucking. Do it. I remember there being a big kerfuffle and kid trying to bring his dog down, and that wasn't cool. And then. The singer of Drop Dead going off on a related yet way too intense tangent about everything and you know the spiky punks. This is for people who stand up for animals and for our future. The song is we have a future. Yeah. We can make a future. Yeah. That's the thing. That shit. We have no future. As long as we continue no to fucking have that attitude, we won't have a future. The arc of Fuzema to me is sort of a going off in two directions where the tension between the music and the politics becomes sort of progressively more exasperated. This song is about this place. And it fucking rules. It's called uh, No Alarm Breaking. No Alarm Breaking at Who's Emma. It deals with the fucking reason that this is the last show here. Probably is because the place got fucking robbed. So, uh, you know, that's fucking stupid. So, uh... There were recorded suspicions of like, you know, are these actually volunteers that are stealing from the till? Are they coming in after hours? Are they stealing during their shift? Because money was going missing, like, on a daily basis. Like, cash was disappearing. I remember the, do like, the door was, like, the lock was broken and they stole, like, 300 CDs. But I think we all knew that calling the police was the right thing to do. The police came in a cruiser to take a report from us, and it was a huge issue. I remember biking by one time, and there were police, there was a police car, and I thought, I jumped off my bike and went running in and was like, what are the police doing here? Who's being arrested? What's going on? We have to get the police out. And they had actually called the police because there had been a robbery. I was, I was just like, what? You called the police? So I was pretty angry about that. And the people who were there were just like, who are you to be angry about this? You're not, a, right? You're not part of who's Emma. And I was like, but I was, and I know that it must be, like what's, okay, something's changed because when I was there, there's no way we would have called the police. I felt really, really bad because she was furious. And she like, she was accusing us of bringing the police into the market. Um, and I actually hadn't looked at it that way not um, being you know, that engaged in kind of the anarchist ideologies of, the, of, uh, of Husema, I didn't even question whether or not we should call the police. I just thought we should call the police. This is a shame. We've lost all of our CDs virtually. The second time was, was not that far off. And I seem to remember it, it being like somebody who had a key, like used a key to open the door. And they didn't really steal that much, but they like sort of just like ransacked the store and like a, let off a fire extinguisher inside. And so that for me was like sort of the tipping point where I was like, well, this happened, this was done by somebody who had a key to the store. And it was just like, you know, what's the point? Like, 
it was it was ridiculous and I was just like that you know that's that's kind of the final straw for the last few months of, of Husema's existence it was space covered in fire extinguisher dust and the collective wasn't that engaged um, so there were a few people just kind of cleaning up the mess as it happened it ended because there wasn't sufficient interest and motivation to keep the place going. I mean, it was really, we kind of exhausted our customer base by being like, okay, there's another benefit, there's another benefit. And it was always like, please give us money. And I think that we finally just like exhausted the generosity of the scene. It's definitely a different mindset. Later on, people, again, came pretty disillusioned. Really in my thinking about Who's Emma, it should be viewed as that kind of utopian experiment or project where people are trying to map out a new method of relating to themselves, relating to commodities, relating to economics, and trying to sort out a new process. And I think whether or not we discuss like, who's Emma as closing or ending, the project was successful in that it allowed people to engage that experiment and engage that discussion. And I think definitely was probably profoundly transformative for a lot of the people who were involved, directly involved, or even peripherally involved in the project. Is this what you call democracy? They're killing us, and you're killing me. Now I know better, now I can see that I don't want to be in democracy. Now is the time for us to strive. Do we know what we're doing? Have we said things right?